My name's Dale, and welcome to Metal Tips and Tricks. I'm really excited about uh, this video because I'm starting a whole new segment I call Build It, Use It. And that's where I end up building some sort of tool, tooling, or a machine to do something here in the shop. Now, let's talk about what is tooling. Tooling is anything that you add to a machine to improve its functionality. What is a tool is more like a hammer, a wrench, a digital caliper. And of course, a machine is like a bridge port. No, we're not going to build a bridge port. I think that would be a little ambitious. But there are other machines that I do need to build from time to time, like a bead roller. So what I want, so why I'm so excited about this, this is going to be an ongoing series teaching you about how to build things for your shop that you can use and expand the capacity of your abilities in your shop. Today, we're gonna build a spindle square. A spindle square is used to tram in the head of your milling machine. What's also unique about these is you don't use them for very many things. They're not a versatile tool. They're pretty much just set up to tram in a milling machine you could do something on the lathe, but it's not quite as accurate. But I've never owned one until now because the one that Starrett sells is over $200 and it's hard to justify expending that kind of money on something that you don't use very often. But with that being said, I've always wanted one because the thing I hate to do most in the shop, and I mean I really do not like to tram the head in because the old way is very frustrating where you set in a dial indicator and you spin it from one side to the other and try to tram this in and well you end up fighting it this here eliminates a lot of that challenge so let's talk about it very simple to build it's basically four parts actually let's count six because we have two screws in it to lock in the dial indicators we have the main body this bar here it's six and a quarter inches long and then pressed into it is a shaft. This shaft here is from three quarter inch cold rolled stock. And then of course, two very affordable dial indicators from Harbor Freight. They're about 15 bucks a piece. So to have about you know, a little over $30 into this project, and it's gonna save me a lot of time, so I think that $30 is a great investment. So let's talk about some of the engineering that goes into this. It's not a complicated thing. The distance here is going to be five inches. And the why I got it set up for five inches is because it fits right on top of the vise. And I can square the vise in and tram the head to the vise. And I can, which is sometimes preferable because you never know if your vise is actually true to your tabletop. When you bolt your vise down, there could be some little shaving in there that you missed, throws it off. So it's better to tram this in. It's a six inch vise, so I decided to go with a five inch on center here. The other things you got that you want to be careful about is these gauges, if they're brought in too close, when you put it in the chuck here, or when you put it in a collet, these gauges will hit the spindle. So you also want to be aware of that. Besides that, this thing isn't rocket science. It's probably one of the easiest tools or tooling to produce. Let's get started and let's get this tool in action. Here's the body. It's one inch square aluminum stock. Very simple. I went with aluminum because, well, that's what I had in my scrap pile. And this is kind of a scrap pile engineering project. You're going to use what materials that you have available. This one inch seems to be perfect. I've already cut it to length, milled down the ends, so now we're ready to put it back in the machine. We're going to drill three holes, one for each gauge, and then also for the main shaft. Very easy to do. What's great here is line up on this. We just want to make sure that our holes come down and perpendicular to the shaft. We just trust the machine to make that happen. 
use one of my favorite tools is the cheap Harbor Freight digital caliper. The full width of this is six and a quarter inches. So we're going to come out here to three and an eight. So that's 1.25. Lock that into place. The length on this is not critical. That's why I'm going to take a measurement in the middle and then I can drill the center holes and these outer holes and be equal. I could go from one end in and over if I wanted to, but that's too much work. And I don't need to be that accurate. I'm going to use the gauge as a scribe. So that's our center. Next we're going to have to center up our bar stock. We'll grab an edge finder. We'll come up here, when the plug picks up, and set our dial to zero. So there's two measurements we're dealing with here. So we know that our pin is 200 thousandths. So we're going to move this 100 thousandths. or our center finder is now in the center. Full axis of the milling machine is dead center on there. And now we have to go in 500 thousandths. One, two, three, four, five. Remember, every rotation on a handle is 200 thousandths of an inch. So we're in center. Lock the shaft, or lock the table, I mean. Now, we're going to turn our center finder over. Bring this down. So remember those two marks we put in? To find center. That's where we're going to right now. I'm going to come over to the right-hand side. I'm going to zero this out. I'm going to be working off the right hand side here because I'm going to drill this from left to right. And the reason I'm going to be on the right hand side is the handle is going to count up for me. So when I rotate it, I can count up, not subtract. If I went on this side one to go from left to right, it's going to count backwards. So it's going to be, well, more opportunity for error if I work off of that handle. And also, I'm working off this handle because, well, that's where my cameras are set up. So it makes it just a little bit easier to film this. I've got this set to zero. I know I need to move over two and a half inches because I want to have this full span of five inches. So let's bring out the calculator. And I'm doing this for a reason. Remember when I just said that every time you turn the handle a full rotation, it's 200,000. So if we take... 2.500, which is two and a half inches, divide it by 0.200, 200 thousandths, and go equal, we get 12 and a half rotations. So it makes the math easier. I'm going to turn this handle 12 and a half times. One, two, three, four, five, 11, 12. And we're going to come up to zero. That's 12. One more, and it's a half. There we go. Pretty simple on the math, isn't it? We're going to now move the table the other way. And because of backlash, because of the inaccuracies in the screw and the way the nut attaches to it, we have some problems. So I'm going to zero this out. I know that my machine is 13 thousandths off. So I'm going to bring this over to 13 thousand. There's 11, 12, 13. Come back to zero. Now I'm set to do the work here. I drill a pilot hole, a 3 8 hole, move it over two and a half inches. We're going to drill a pilot hole, 3 8 half inch. Then go another two and a half inches and drill the final set of holes.
So remember, we're relying on the machine to keep our accuracy. We're already centered here. This is where we're going to go back 12 and a half turns of the crank. So, one, two, yeah. 11, 12 and a half. Centered up to where we need to go. This is where the advantage of a keyless chuck is excellent. Because I can easily just switch this out. Now, I'm going to tell you something about keyless chucks. This is, goes up to a half inch. Do not put anything larger in it than a half inch. I don't care if you have, well, let me grab a drill bit. Technically, you can put this drill bit inside this chuck. Don't ever be tempted to do it because the action on this chuck, it self tightens. If you end up putting something in there larger than a half inch, this has more lever, leverage action when it's drilling, and it will tighten up around the shaft to where you may not get it off without damaging the chuck. I say that having a very expensive education. This is a cheap Chinese um, chuck. It's a copy of an Albright. The reason I'm not using my Albright chuck is because it got damaged when I used too large a bit on it. And, well, let's just say, very expensive education, and I hope you learn from what I just told you. I don't want to hear an email saying, hey, I used it, it worked. Guess what, you got lucky. Next time, you're not gonna get lucky. So let's keep, keep drilling. So we drilled the pilot hole, we're gonna do a 3 8 inch. Now this hole that I'm drilling here is really up to the size of material that you're working with. I'm going to drill a half inch. Well, I'll go into the details a little bit later, but this is going to be a half inch hole. The shaft is going to be turned down and pressed fit into here. This is a good time to talk about peck drilling. Now, you'll notice I just drill down a little bit, the little, little short shaving come out. Well, the reason I do that is it's easier to clean up and it's safer. When these chips get really long and gnarly, well, they're harder to sweep up, harder to keep clean. So imagine long shavings like that are not safe and they're harder to clean up. So I'm going to keep peck drilling this. Two holes down, rinse and repeat. So we need to go 12 and a half rotations again. One, two, and we're going to go to a half. And then. I find it interesting. I've had people comment on some of my videos about WD-40 is not a cutting oil or cutting fluid. Well, you're right. It's actually a penetrating fluid. And it's designed to penetrate water and get the steel so the water can be dispersed. And that's what this is called, WD-40, which is Water Disbursement Formula Number 40. It meant it took 40 times. Why it works so good on drilling aluminum is WD-40 likes to stick to steel more than it likes to stick to aluminum. So it prevents the aluminum from galling and gluing itself or welding itself right onto the, to the drill bit. Next, we need to deeper the uh, 
the holes. Now I could have put, put this in as a drilling process, but I decided not to. I'm going to just do it by hand. go back to our, our prototype. I've got two holes I need to drill in here to set a um, Allen cap headed screw. This is kind of a simple thing. This size here is I think 1024. Again, use what you guys have in stock. Now we need to drill those next two holes and we have to mark them. This is going to be one of those things that's going to drive some of you just crazy. And the reason is because I'm not measuring and being detailed. And sometimes you can take up too much time being too accurate when it doesn't need to be done. And this is a great case of this. I'm going to just kind of take a measurement by hand, mark it there, look about where center is, mark it again. Do the same thing over here. Boy, I'll bet some of you are freaking out right now. But it's good enough for this particular project. I don't need to build, you know, if I had to build 50 of these, I would do it a different way. I would set up stops and that kind of stuff and have it detailed. This is a one-time operation. So let's make our lives easy. The whole drilling process on this one's going to be a little bit more complicated. We're going to do a pilot hole, a hole for the threading, then we're going to come through halfway, drill it open so the threading is clear, and then we're going to tap it. First will be the pilot hole. for thread clearance. It's only going to go down a half an inch. And again, I'm going to ballpark it. I've got a gauge up here, up on the top of the head. I'm just going to ballpark a half inch. Now for the cap head screw. Now these have a flat bottom on them, so we're just going to use a mill end bit drill and clean that out. Check it, do it again. Next, we cap it. This is a good one to power tap. But since I haven't been uh, working in the shop in a while because of, well, moving, I'm going to do it by hand. Aluminum's always great to do by hand anyway. I don't want to break this tap off. There we go. So flip it over, rinse and repeat. I will do that off camera, then I'll meet you.
We're here at the 14 inch delta bandsaw. This is actually what's called a wood metal bandsaw. It's got an extra transmission hiding inside it that helps gear it down to cut metal. Now this is my favorite saw in the entire shop. It was a gift from my brother Terry about two Christmases ago. He picked this up on Craigslist and to be honest, it was not in perfect condition. Well, it was excellent. It was about two weeks before Christmas. I was going down to California to visit my in-laws. And while I was gone, Terry completely refinished, stripped this whole thing down and painted it, refurbished it, brought it back to its original shape and its original color in two weeks. And when I got home from, from Christmas, he had it all wrapped up with a big bow on it sitting in my shop. What an excellent, excellent surprise. So Terry, thank you. So let's talk about working on the next part of the spindle square, and that's to cut this relief slot in the base. And what this relief slot is for is when you tighten down the screw, it allows it to clamp around the dial indicator. Now, the further we get back here, the easier it is to clamp and the less we have to torque down the screw. So we're gonna probably go back about a half inch on this hole. And let me show you how I'm gonna do that. Again, this is gonna drive you machinists crazy. So what I need to do is I need to cut this slot. So I'm just gonna do a measurement here by hand and I'm just gonna mark it. Now I could do this with a square, do it a bunch of other ways, but it's not that critical. And we need to figure out how far back we want to cut it. Yeah, I'm going to take it a little further. Come over to this side, check it. Come back here. Yeah, I'm pretty close. Okay. This is a bimetal blade, very fine tooth, great for cutting tubing, not great for cutting solid material. But this is what blade I have in it, and sometimes I'm just too lazy to switch out to go for the right blade for such a short cut. Now, I normally do not use any kind of lubricant on a bandsaw for cutting metal. And I do that, family reasons, is just putting oil on this blade to me is not effective. And the reason that is is the oil ends up getting sucked into the gullets and then the shavings that we cut off or the, um, I don't want to call it sawdust, the metal dust gets impregnated and doesn't get released from the blade. So I like to use these saws totally dry. But we're gonna break one of my rules right now and we're gonna try the Anchor Lube. Anchor Lube is a uh, product I've never used when I was down in LA visiting Stan from Bar Z, he's got a YouTube channel, and he gave me some of this. We're gonna try it out here on the bandsaw. I've got one side we're gonna keep clean, and we're just gonna cut, we're gonna rotate it around, and then try the anchor lube.
a little bit faster, a little easier to push on. I wasn't pushing as hard. Um, I think it's got some great advantages. I don't like the mess. That's one of the problems, but that's a problem with every lubrication. It'd be fun to actually try this with WD-40 and see what would happen, but we'll save that for another time. So let's get over the metal lathe and turn the top shaft down. We're here at the Enco lathe to finish up the second to the last step on our spindle square. What we get to do now is turn the shaft down. And we need to get some measurements before we do that. We drilled this hole out a half an inch. One thing we know about drill bits is they're great at making inaccurate holes. We know this is not going to be a true half inch. So let's pull out some digital calipers and measure this. And we're going to find out this is reading 0.4975. It's reading a little shy of a half inch hole. But we can't use dial calipers or digital calipers like this to measure the interior of a hole and expect an accurate reading. And the reason is because these blades on here are not coplanar. They're not in alignment. They're actually shifted from one side to the other. And the top part the surface where it actually touches and measures on these aren't sharp. They're actually a flat. So when you're reading an interior diameter, especially as small as a half inch hole, we're getting an inaccurate reading. The right way to do it is to come in with a snap gauge. And the snap gauge is a very cool tool. We're going to just snap this in, take it out. Now let's make a reading. The right way to read this is with a micrometer, but we're going to still just stick with the digital. I can't read it off the very front because the surfaces here are both curved. We're going to come back here on the anvil and measure it. So 0 0.502. As you can see, this is reading the hole four or five thousandths more in diameter than the back jaws here. So we're going to trust this over this. Very important to realize digital and dial calipers like this are great reference tools. I use them all the time, but I also don't expect exact accuracy. The stock we're going to use for this is just three quarter inch. This is a junk pile engineering project, so go with what kind of material you have in stock. We now have the stock in the lathe simple turning. We're going to turn this back just shy of an inch because I like the look of this not being flush to the uh, main bar. That's up to you. You guys can do whatever you want here. To me, I just want it just a little shallow. I don't have to grind it, sand it off later. Get in here and do some cutting. Referencing is a great way for course measurements. And what I'm doing here is I know my cutter here is a half inch. So I basically just went double the width. Let's see what we got here. Well, that's not too bad. 0.987. Maybe I'll go a little bit further. But it gives you an idea that there are things that we work with on a daily basis that we can use for course measurements. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. Point five eight seven, so we'll go in half of the eight seven, so we're going to go in forty zero. Yeah, we better not. Let's just go in twenty. Another twenty. Very close. I want to do a press fit on this, and we're going to be at about a thousand silver. We're going to go in 
one and a half thousandths. And we're gonna go just for a nice little slow feed. And I'm gonna, see, we're gonna see how good I am here. If I'm a little, a little large, I'll actually do the final diameter with a file. Alright, I think that's going to work for me. I want to rework the shoulder just a little bit. It's not flat. And the reason I am pressing this into place instead of sc screwing it into place or doing something else is because I feel the press fit is what's going to hold it square. We're trying to trust the accuracy of our milling machine to get all three of these holes in alignment. And if I try to thread this, the thread may be off one way or another, and that's not going to be favorable to screwing this together and then hoping it's an accurate tool. So press fitting this, in my opinion, is the best way to do it. The angle of this bit when it cut in actually cut this in at a slight taper. And what I just did now is I just cleaned off the outer shoulder. I still have a taper um, inside a little bit close on the edge. And the reason for that is I feel you'll get a better fit. If I were to keep this completely square and a burr developed when pressing it in, it might throw it off a little bit. So also with a press fit, we need to put a pretty healthy chamfer on this. And the reason for the chamfer is just to get it to guide through. If I was doing a more detailed project, I would have reamed this hole to an exact size and it also do a lot smoother finish on this piece than I am presently. But like I keep saying, this tool isn't rocket science. If I was manufacturing them, I would be doing this completely different. But this is a one-off and the level of measuring that I'm doing for this will, will be more than adequate for what I'm trying to do on this project. Okay, feeding the trolls twice on that one. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have caught it. Some people say, don't file over the top of the chuck. Only time I've ever, ever hit the chuck filing is when I try to do something left-handed when I'm a right-handed person and I don't have the skills left-handed that I do right-handed and I'll try to do this and the file will get pulled over into the chuck. The other thing is I'm using a lathe file and the angle that is cut here is really steep and that allows the chips to slide out much quicker and with less um, problem but it also makes this file want to kick over quicker. So you really have to get steady, get in there, and do it. And I'm going to see how many people know how I fed the trolls twice on this one. I just gave you one. You guys find the other. Now we're going to do the polishing of the shaft. Bring this out. Get some emery cloth. See this one's been around the block a couple times, but it'll polish out just fine. This one we got to go a little faster. Let's save some time, speed it up. That should work. Again, this is a scrap metal project. It's whatever scraps I've got there, I'm putting this together. I'm going to bet 
that this is going to be fine. I'm going to cut this to length next, turn around, chamfer for the back side, and then I'm going to meet you over at the press. It's time to assemble the spindle square. We've got our shaft, we've got our main body, and we're going to press this into position. There's different ways we can press. I've got this um, homemade press that uh, looks homemade. It was designed for one project. It was assembled out of um, a stair, what do they call it, a stair elevator. You know, you bolt it to the wall and they have a chair that you ride up. The cylinder came out of a human body lift. So if you need to pull somebody out of a bed, that's what the hydraulic system came from. What I like about this is it's got like, I don't know, 12, 14 inches of travel. Great advantage. It's funny, I built this for one job. I've had it now for about two years. It's one of the great tools in the shop. So simple to build, so versatile that I want to build a bigger one someday. But that's for another build it, use it project. So let's press this together. Actually, there's different ways to press this together. If you don't have a press, you can put this into a vise, squeeze it together. You could use a bar clamp. You can use, boy, whatever you have that can pinch down on this. I do not suggest using a hammer, though. This is not a job for a hammer. We're trying to be somewhat delicate here. But let me show you how this is going to work. It's very simple. The goal here is to keep it square. Just press it in. This is when you're going to find out why I put such a good taper at the beginning. If you don't, sometimes if it goes in a little crooked, it's going to bind, catch, cause you problems. There we go. Nice fit, isn't it? Now you can see why when I turned this and put a shoulder on it and how I set up that shoulder, why I did that so that would fit up really nice and flush. See the bottom of it here? Just, just shy of being flush to the bottom of this. I think that looks really nice. Let's finish the assembly and put the um, screws in and the uh, gauges. We're at the home stretch now to finishing up this project. We just have to do the final assembly. It's very easy. Put the two screws in. Do not tighten them yet. Just get them in place. So this is the first of three videos on this use it, build it, or build it, use it episode. The first one, of course, is building it. The second episode, which will be number, instead of going one, two, and three, I'm going to go A, B, and C. So the next one is going to be B. It's going to be how to use it, okay? Build it, use it. The third one, what we're going to do is, well, I think the term is pimping it. We are going to make this spindle square look cool. Not just be practical, but we're going to make it to where it looks cool. And that's going to be a fun video. Plus, we're going to build a case for it. Stan over at Bar Z kind of inspired me when I was at his place. He builds these great little triangle squares. And he puts them in a nice, beautiful, simple, easy to build wood case. And I thought a case similar to what he does to build one for these would be great and really nice to have so the spindle square doesn't get damaged. So there we go. This is all assembled. Ready to go to service. So let's go over to the mill. Actually, let's back up here a minute. Before we go over to the mill, let me talk to you about something. I want to give this spindle square away. I'm not going to give it with the gauges. Those you're going to have to go to Harbor Freight and get yourself, or you can order them online. I want to give this away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up an email address that you can email your information. What I'll need to have is your name and your address. So if you win, 
I can send it to you. Don't worry, I'm not going to use the information. I'm not that smart to know what to do with it anyway. It's just kind of my way to give back to you guys, but before I can, you have to enter the contest. The email address, I think, is going to be um, toolgiveaway at metaltipsandtricks.com. Haven't set up yet, but you'll see by the time I get to the third video, I'll have that all figured out. There will be a drawing at the end, and you guys will get a chance to win this. The drawing is only going to be up for two weeks, okay, from the last video, and I'll give an exact date at that time. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, project. I think this is one of the coolest things I've built and probably one of the most useful. So until next time, go out in your shop, build something cool like a spindle square. That our holes come down perpendicularly, perpendicular, yeah, that the holes come in perpendicular to one, each, one another. Boy, I'm having a hard time speaking today. Let's try that one more time.